we're going to do something a little different today. And I don't know if we've told you this or not, because I like to invite you onto the podcast and then completely surprise you by what we're doing. So you feel very uncomfortable. Just kidding. Um, we're going to unpack all of the incredible research and insight that you share on stages and with corporations around the world about happiness by having you give our listeners advice. And before we jump into the seven questions that we have for you, I wanted to just ask you so that we are all starting on the same playing field. What is the definition of happiness? Do you want me to answer that now or? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, we define happiness. I define happiness as the joy you feel moving towards your potential. So it's both uh, an emotion, right? That is directional, right? It's it got a valence to it. It's positive, but that it doesn't stop. It's not complacent. It actually leads to seeing more of what we're capable of in terms of, you know, our potential as an athlete or as a musician or a parent or a poet. So do we get it wrong when we're just in our day to day life saying to ourselves, I don't feel happy? Like, are we talking about happiness wrong? Is that part of the problem? I think that could be. Um, I, but I think because I think we use happy in so many different ways, right? I'm not happy with this hotel room or I'm not happy within this moment. Um, what we're looking for is not that um, that moment of happiness because it's so fleeting. If you're trying to hold on to that, it just slips through our fingers almost as soon as we define it. Um, what we're looking for is more of uh, an emotional trajectory within someone's life that even when someone is suffering, they can actually experience joy in the midst of that. I mean, the reason why I love that we've conflated the ideas of happiness and joy together is that if happiness was based on the pleasure model, you know, pleasure is fleeting. It's so short lived. We only have it when things are good. But joy is something we can experience even when life is not good, like in the midst of childbirth. It's not high levels of pleasure all the time, but moments of joy can correspond even with the highest amounts of fear and pain we can experience as human beings. So I love that there's, uh, that there's, I, I think what we need is redefinition of what we mean when we talk about happiness. They're stuck in uh, a, a single moment, but what we're looking for is what's the trajectory in that moment. That even if I'm experiencing pain, whether it be back pain or fatigue or whatever it is that someone's experiencing, that we want them to actually experience joy in the midst of that so that we can make the negative experiences, those troughs shorter. So maybe I should ask you, what the heck is joy? Because as you're talking about childbirth, I'm like, Sean, I don't know what kind of epidural they had in your wife, but I did not experience a whole lot of joy until the crown was over and the kid was out and I was done uh, you know, with it and they handed me the ice pack to put in my underwear. So when you talk about right. joy, what do you mean? Well, even even in those moments, once we've had the baby, there's, you know, it's not suddenly that everything's perfect again. Now they're waking us up, right? And now we're taking care of this little thing that we have no idea how to take care of, at least we didn't. And we're already exhausted at that point, <laughs> right? And then the doctors leave the room, like, uh, what do we do at this moment? It, I think if we're constantly looking for that moment where like everything is great, that there's no stress, the race is finished, what we find is it never actually happens for people because as soon as they finish the race, they're thinking about what they need to do when they get home. Or as soon as they get that promotion, they're immediately thinking about, you know, what am I going to do now that I have this promotion? And how do I get this person on my team to be more become more positive? Um, the joy that we're experiencing is that feeling like that we're not stagnant. Mm. Um, there is that high, um, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I haven't really studied very much, but I know it goes from the base, uh, it was basic needs all the way up to self-actualization through stages of, I think it's self-confidence and self-esteem. Um, what we find is that happiness doesn't occur at only one of those moments that we find, you know, and you've seen this as well, that in our travels, we go to places that are quite impoverished where we'd assume that, you know, given what the people that are there have or their lack of options, that they would be miserable all the time. And we we don't find that. We find happiness in these surprising places where you feel joy and optimism, even in places where I might feel imprisoned. Um, 
that it's not where you are on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs that determines your happiness. It's whether or not you feel like you're moving up on it, mm. that there's growth. And I think that the moments in my career where even if you've written a book, you know, I, I kind of thought, you know, it, as you know, like if, if you write a book, I thought I was done. I, that was the mountaintop experience. I did it. That was my baby, right? It was much less painful uh, than what my wife turned through. But like, I felt like, oh, I did it. And then you realize, wait, I kind of want people to read this. And what if people think I'm a fraud? And how do I, oh, maybe I need to write another book or I want to get it on a bestseller list or how, how do I turn this into changing more people's life? You realize it's not even done. <laughs> You've actually only started when the book uh, came out. And there's this sense of uh, uh, futility that can occur within those moments. That, 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 that moment I thought would create greater levels of happiness in my life don't. But if we're able to experience joy as we move through those uh, pursuit of goals, that's the only place I think we, that anyone finds it. That's why I think people can be very happy where they have very lower means, but they suddenly get some extra money or they work really hard for something and they're able to buy their kid a present, hmm. right? Or, or braces, right? Or that, you know, you write a book and it doesn't guarantee levels of happiness, but then someone tells you something about how it impacted their life. And even though you might've heard it a hundred times, you kind of needed to hear it again, right? To remember that this was important or that, you know, you're doing something meaningful in this world. So I think that that's what it is, is that it's that constant search of meaning that allows us to feel like what we're doing on our daily actions is moving us up towards self-actualization, which I don't know what Maslow meant when he said that, but to me, it means um, the, my highest potential as Sean, right? As a dad, as you know, a husband, as you know, a speaker, as a, a terrible tennis player. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, honestly am a little confused about the difference between happiness and joy. And I have a feeling that our first question from Tina is going to open the door to you really landing this plane and this distinction for us. So let's roll that clip from Tina. Hi, Mel. I want to know how to change from thinking that you can only achieve happiness depending on external things. If I had enough money if I had a job, if I had a partner, to finding it within you. Sean? I love that question. So I, the reason I love it is that the original way the psychology looked at happiness was just a pleasure or pain model. That all we're doing as human beings is responding to things that feel good in that moment or things that hurt and we run away from those. And then they decided pleasure must be what happiness is because um, we're running towards that all the time. Um, to me, I don't think that there should be a difference between happiness and joy. I, I want there to be confusion because I want the two to be conflated. I think we oh. need to help redefine happiness for the world, that happiness is the joy you feel moving towards your potential. So I want people to have a disruption in that model because of exactly what was asked in that question. It was a great question because um, I think that you know, we assume that the external world is a good predictor of people's levels of happiness. That's why when parents say they want the best for their kids, they want their kids to be happy, they assume that means in a good school or like the top of their team, or they mean something in their head that that, that determines success and that's going to guarantee happiness because they've checked off some externals. But when you look at the research, as you know, the external world is a terrible predictor of happiness, right? We find happiness in all these surprising places and we find unhappiness in places where people have everything. Um, I cut my teeth on this research when I was at Harvard. And I, when I got in, I, I had never been there. I had only seen it in the movies. I applied on a dare. I was so I was a volunteer firefighter. I wasn't like a val valedictorian or anything. And I was so happy that I got in. And I assumed that everyone who got into a place, an environment with opulence and opportunity would be guaranteed happiness. Yeah. Um, what we found is that 80% of them go through work debilitating depression once they get there. And another 10%, the last time this was public, contemplated taking their lives. And then when I traveled to, you know, and those are statistics. Are you talking about just somewhat, Harvard? Just Harvard in that moment. Um, and you were one of which, them. I was one of them. And we can get to that too. I went through depression myself, actually, after I graduated, um, when my job was to make sure that the first year students who went from being you know, top 1% of their school now realize that half of the students are now below average. Um, how 
we could stop them from going through depression or anxiety. But they were in this incredible place, right? They had a success. It should have guaranteed levels of happiness. The worldly and external factors should have guaranteed happiness and it didn't. When I traveled to 50 countries doing this research, I learned very quickly that the story that I just described had nothing to do with Harvard. It's how the brain processes the world. That if we think our happiness is based upon the externals, the problem is that every time your brain has a success, it changes the goalpost of what success looks like. And as soon as that occurs, then what should have created great levels of happiness didn't. So you get a degree, don't get excited yet, you don't have a job. You get a job, don't get excited yet, you have to get through inflation or you got to get that promotion. You know, how do you, you change married. this? I think we all like at some point you wake up and recognize I've been living this. I'll be happy when I'll be happy when I get the house. I'll be happy when I finally have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a partner. I'll be happy when I lose yeah. the pounds. I'll be happy when this and that model doesn't work. And what Tina's asking is how the hell do I change my mindset? How do I stop? Well, I trying to find it outside of me. I don't even know how to begin to find it inside of me. In fact, you mentioned that you were depressed and I was reading an article where you were interviewed and you said that you were writing in a journal during this period and the first entry you wrote was, I don't remember being happy and I don't think I'll ever be happy again. And now you're like the, the world's guru of happiness. So in that moment though, Sean, you had an experience that I think everybody has at some point. I'm not happy and I don't think I'll ever be happy again. And so what are like, what's the first thing that you would want somebody to know if that's where you are right now? I think the very first thing I'd want is actually the recognition. Cause I kind of wish I had known that earlier, that mm. whole thing we're talking about. Cause I think you're right. I think we all have that moment where you realize I thought I'd be happy when and it didn't work. But then if you ask somebody why they're not happy, they'll tell you about one of their externals, right? I'm not happy right now because I don't have a boyfriend. I'm yes. not happy right now because I've got this guy at work, right? I'm not happy right now because I don't have enough money. Um, so I think the very first step might be acknowledging it, mm. that the human brain is designed to foil any attempt that success will guarantee happiness. Because every time you hit one of those targets, we change what we think would create happiness. I think the best example of that is actually the pandemic, because I think at the beginning of it, in the middle of it, everyone thought, think how happy we're going to be when the pandemic wanes. <laughs> and true. the pandemic is waning and we don't have that guaranteed levels of happiness. And what we forgot was there wasn't 100% levels of happiness before the pandemic, right? So I think the first is a recognition that this isn't working. From there, I think that it requires a mindset, sh mindset shift and a behavioral shift. Um, in that article and in the work that I do, I research what we can do to create happiness when the world doesn't look like it should. And I think one Ooh. important caveat to that is that while I'm talking about what we can do internally, that doesn't negate the need for external changes. Yes, We have systemic reasons while there's inequality, discrimination, racism that we should fight. Absolutely. I believe what gives us the power to fight that is the internal changes. Yes. So, um, and that everyone needs to do it, not just you know the people seeking happiness, right? The people who are being discriminatory need to do it too. So let's start but, with the mindset. What is what yeah. is one step, one simple step that somebody who is sitting alone like Sean, unhappy Sean, back in, you know, the yeah. mid uh, 2010s writing, I don't remember being happy and I don't think I'll ever be happy again. How the hell do you change your mindset? Because if you keep saying that to yourself, you're not going to be able to access happiness within. Right. Well, I think there's something unique in that moment because I was attempting to do something about it because I'm trying to write in a journal to be happier. I'm just like, I don't think this is going to work, <laughs> um, which we know from research, you know, that's not a great mentality. Like you can predict um, the treat the, the course of treatment based on whether or not you believe the doctor can heal you. Right. So um, that was a not an auspicious place to start. OK, so, Sean, are you telling us? that what you're about to tell us to do is going to work and we should believe in our ability to change our mindset and to take actions and to access happiness. Yes, I would actually, I would wholeheartedly say that. Not only because I've experienced myself, but then we've researched it ever since. I mean, what I've learned in this research is that depression was not the end of the story at all. And mm -hmm. that even in the midst of a broken world, in fact, only in the midst of a broken world, 
have we ever been able to create happiness? So the question is, how do we do so? I think the starting point is realizing not only that our, our strategy wasn't working, but acknowledging that there are multiple realities in this moment. And one of them is, you know, I don't have a boyfriend or girlfriend, or I don't have this money, or I don't have this job that I want, or I'm frustrated about whatever it is. I think when you acknowledge that that's true, you could say that's one reality, but there's also some other realities as well. Um, you know, last week, uh, in the, last week I went to the hospital because I was having chest pains. You were? I'm young, yeah. I was in the ER. I missed my very first talk in two decades. And, you know, I realized in that moment when they strip you of kind of everything and, you know, the doctor's going to knock on the door. When the doctor knocked on the door, I was like, this could change my life. It didn't. I was completely fine. But in that moment, like my whole life changed, right? It, it, my whole life could have changed and was completely disrupted within those moments. I think when we realize that there's multiple realities in that moment, one of them is I missed a talk. I'm not with my family. I'm in a hospital I don't want to be in. That's true. On the other hand, I'm going home today, right? I'm going home to two kids that I love and a wife that I love, right? Those are equally true, but in the same reality. And because my brain has a limited amount of resources, I need to choose. And I need to choose what I'm going to be focusing my brain on. There is so much negative in this world that I could spend the entire rest of my life focusing upon that and upon my fear. But that, that doesn't serve me at all. It's not a valuable reality for me. That in the midst of these multiple and true realities, I'm going to look at the ones that and focus on the ones that are going to allow me to fix the negative parts of my life. Or that are at least going to give me the optimism and happiness and joy to take the next step and the next step. In, the, in depression, I just needed a step forward. I felt like I just stopped moving. Um, so I started doing these habits and these are the habits that we know work. And these are all the things you know about as well, right? The gratitude, for example. And I think that, that this would be my answer to someone sitting there and to that, you know, that, that 26 year old boy who was feeling this, um, was in those moments, I needed to scan. I need to stop scanning for all the deficits in my life. And I need to use some of those finite resources to scan the world for the things that I was grateful for. And it was hard because my brain kept being like, yes, but what about this? Yes. But what about this thing you don't have, right? Yes. So I had yes. to literally train my brain and we train it exactly like we've seen anything else with the human body is I had to keep doing it, right? Like I can't build a bicep if I only lift a weight once <laughs> then I'm done, right? I had to do it every day and I had to create a pattern out of it even when I wasn't sure it was going to work. And even when I could see no change in my life, I'd uh, say for the first, you know, easily for the first two weeks, I saw no change in my life. Well, I want to, there trying to, wanna, oh, go yeah. ahead. You, sorry. I'm just sitting there writing down things I'm grateful for. And my life still feels terrible. Like I remember breathing hurt, um, when I was depressed because like everything hurt, like and everything didn't seem like it was worthwhile. Um, I what think one kept thing you that's really going? Say, so that's the, that's the thing. And I don't get to talk about this much in any of the interviews. So I'd love to talk about this too, because I think you're going deeper, you know, than some of the surface questions we normally get. The, I think that the habits are what pulled me out of depression. I write my gratitudes. I journal, I do exercise. Um, I, uh, write a two minute, uh, kind note almost every day. I'd say 90 plus percent days since my mid twenties. I know that when I don't do those things, it's like when I don't brush my teeth, I get this film in my mouth. That's what I feel like my world looks like when I don't do those habits. Mm. Those habits are the way, the building blocks for creating happiness. But the turning point for me, which I never get to talk about, the turning point for me in all this was actually not me. Um, my job was to make sure other people didn't get depressed. So I kept trying to be there for other people. I was just supposed to be this paragon of, you know, of knowing what you're supposed to do in optimism, right? And I kept going deeper and deeper in depression because I knew that there is a dissonance between what I was feeling and what I was showing to the world. The turning point for me and what actually got me to try to do those habits was at the bottom uh, of the depression for me, I turned to my eight closest friends and family and told them that I was going through depression. And you know, some, a couple of these people were sort of my competitors there at Harvard, right? Or my peers. And I, I told him I was going through depression. I said, it's genetic. There's nothing you can do. You know, my grandmother, grandparents, and like, it's genetic. I just wanted to tell somebody. But immediately the groundswell of support was phenomenal. They kept calling me. They emailed me. They met up with me. They, uh, one of them brought me cupcakes. It's not what I did it, you know, to get cupcakes. But as soon as I, as soon as I did that, 
everything changed. And the reason for it was actually a study I found way later in my life. Um, it was a study by these two researchers in Virginia, and they found that if you look at a hill, you need to climb in front of you. If you look at that hill by yourself, your brain shows you a picture of a hill that looks 20 to 30% steeper when you're alone compared to that hill that you look at of the same height while standing next to someone who you're told is going to climb the hill with you. So I said that in a convoluted way. When you're alone, hills actually look 20 to 30% steeper to the visual cortex, wow. which is amazing because I thought we have this objective view of the world, right? That's bad. This is good. This is how tall that mountain is. And what we realized was it was one of those matrix moments where I realized that the world is not objective, it's subjective. And that hill, those challenges are collapsing and expanding based upon whether or not you think you're radically alone going through this and trying to get out of this or whether you're with other people. So as soon as I did that, as soon as I opened up to other people, that was the turning point because it was the move from happiness as a self-help idea to this rec recognition that happiness was not an individual sport at all. And suddenly that hill of overcoming depression in front of me dropped by 20 to 30%. And they opened up about things they were dealing with. None of them was depression, but it was just challenges they were experiencing. And we started creating these meaningful narratives and social bonds that made me want to do the habits because there was something worth doing the habits for. Mm. So it was a combination of habits and social connection and a mindset shift that allowed in that moment to break from this idea that nothing matters and that there's nothing that I can do that matters and I have to just wait for the world to change. Are you ready to put your happiness hat on? What if I told you that we have the OG of happiness research. So many of you are writing and you're struggling with happiness. And what Sean says and what he teaches on stages around the world is that you and I have happiness all wrong. The definition is wrong. That's part of the problem. He is gonna teach you that if you do these four habits for 21 days, you will be a happier you. 